Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Asante. I am a comedy commissioner at the BBC. Um, I'm really, really happy and excited to be here to um, have this conversation with Neris Evans. Um, Neris is currently creative director of comedy at a production company called Expectation. But before that, Neris was a commissioning editor at Channel 4 Comedy, um, which is where we met. Um, you'll find a lot of parallels between BBC Comedy and Channel 4 Comedy. A lot of people sort of cross those <laughs> aisles throughout their career. Careers. Um, so, Neris, you joined Expectation after working as a commissioning editor mm -hmm. um, at Four, where you commissioned um, to name a few shows. And can I have a show of hands if you've heard of these shows? Oh, um, no, Catastrophe, Silent, <laughs> Dairy Girls, oh, yes, oh, um, Flowers, The Windsors, mm -hmm. and a wonderfully named show called Scrotal Recall. Anyone? Come on. Anyone? Come on. <laughs> one, <two. laughs> um, before that, you worked at the BBC where you produced um, another little show called Miranda mm -hmm. um, and other shows such as Jonathan Creek and French and Saunders. So just give us a little bit about um, a little bit of information about your background, how you started your journey in TV. How long have you got? Um, what I'd like to do to begin with is kind of I know you're all students and you're all from different genres and you're all probably from very different backgrounds, but I'm from Wales. Anyone in from Wales? No? That's what happens all the time. I'm working telly, no one's from Wales. OK, great. Well, I'm from kind of a very small town in Wales. No one I know ever worked in television, had the dream of working in television. I had no in, no kind of insider advice. I just followed my dream and worked really, really hard to try and get my foot in the door. And I suppose, you know, I'm not an extraordinary person. I'm just very lucky to have worked with some really lovely people and work quite hard. And I can explain what I've done. I know you won't want to do exactly what I've done because times have changed. But I suppose there's a few things that I'd love to kind of share and say, you know, what you should be doing more of or what not to do. Mm -hmm. But I suppose also it's really hard. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's, um, it's getting harder to get into telly and people like me probably don't get into telly as much as, uh, you know, they used to do. Um, so I think, you know, the RTS to get behind students and to really support them and to give them an insight into how to get, how to get into, you know, a, pr a production or a bit of a... Um, information about the industry I think is brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. I can see here that we share um, a parallel journey. You started off in reception at Avalon and then worked yes. your way over to the BBC. So I'm a comedy kind of massive fan, grew up watching comedy. All I wanted was to do something in comedy. I didn't know what that might be. Um, when I went to university, I did politics. I was like an idiot, didn't think I could do anything creative. So I did that, but what I found within Liverpool John Moores University, which is just a very nice little university, um, was I could do something extracurricular, and I joined the, um, the student radio at the time. So that's where I got my creative break to do something that was a self-starting thing to do. And I worked with a lot of comedians, and we did a comedy show. So that's where I started. And then from there on, I just wanted to work in comedy. So I joined a huge management agency called Avalon, who look after Frank Skinner and lots of um, and Russell Howard, people like that. Um, and I just worked on reception and I thought I'd won the lottery because I could go and see live comedy, get paid to do it. Um, and from there, I wheedled my way into television. Um, but it took a long time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and yes, from going to, on reception there, I then moved to the BBC to be a PA and to, to be a, um, a secretary, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and what does the day-to-day -day life of a PA look like in well, the BBC back then? Again, I was just very fixated on working in comedy, so I had made a beeline for the comedy department and was the assistant to the head of uh, new comedy, a lady called Mavan Wee Moore. Um, and she produced Little Britain. So because I was just in the office and she was about to produce this show, I there wasn't a, a, a big debate. I put myself forward to be production secretary, not even knowing what it meant, um, <laughs> and did a lot of photocopying for about a year. But it did mean that I saw the whole process through from Matt and David sitting in a room, uh, kind of going through scripts and reading things aloud. And if I didn't laugh, they'd put a cross through them. So yeah. it was an extraordinary insight into the editorial process of comedy. So every job, I think, you you know, for me personally, you learn something, even if it isn't the end job you want to do, mm. you can glean so much information from just being part of a process. Absolutely. I echo that because I started my career at Channel 4 in 2006 as an assistant to the commissioning team. I started in factual um, and moved around. But the key thing was proximity to the, lead, the heads of department, paying attention, asking questions, making yourself useful 
for, making sure that anything they needed done, you were there for. So it could be as small as the T's, but it could be as big as, can you read the script and do me a report? Can you come along to this edit and see what you think? So, you know, I, I really love what you have to say about that. And then from working with Mafanway on Little Britain, um, a little pilot came your way called Miranda. Well, yes, it's a few years later, but I mean, so as far as comedy goes, it's very similar to other production. You can either work in, you could be crew and you can be somebody that films it or records it. You can be part of the production team, a production manager, a production secretary like myself that had no real input into what the show was. But the dream would be to be a director or, or a producer where you have a creative role uh, and work alongside talent um, performers or writers. So that's the direction I wanted to go in. So I somehow made the leap into via comic relief where I worked for one year trying to help out doing little bits and bobs on that. And then I eventually became an associate producer under a brilliant uh, producer called Joe Sargent. And Joe produced French and Saunders um, and Ab Fab and things like that. So I learned a huge amount. And that's the other thing. There are so many clever people in this industry. Just make friends with them. Yes, definitely. And, um, and learn from them. And, um, and I was very lucky to work with her. Um, and she'd put Miranda in a French and Saunders sketch, or, um, a scene within French and Saunders. I think she was also in, maybe I'm getting that wrong, is Ab Fab she was in with Nathan Lane. So they had a, you know, they knew who she was and she was brilliant. So she was always in the office um, and Dawn and Jennifer loved her. So we ended up working something up. So then I was very lucky to um, work on that first script with her. And we did the pilot of Miranda right. in front of a studio audience. So that was an early bit of talent scouting. So well, yes. How brilliant she was in that thing. But she'd been around for 10 something. years. Right, of course. No such <laughs> yeah. thing as overnight success in this industry. Anyone knew that you're seeing and loving for the first time, they've probably been on a long road. Yeah. So before we go into um, how Miranda was developed and how it was received and things like that, um, we should queue up the first clip um, and then Neris, you can talk us through Yeah, afterwards. of course. If your mum does set you up, just look at it as good dating practice. Might help with Gary. Gary and I are just friends. Really, it's easier. And anyway, I don't need help with dating. I've been on loads of dates. I've literally been on one. <laughs> so, you know, don't doubt me, Stevie. I am a smooth operator. <laughs> Heaven's sake. <laughs> Darling, it was absolutely mortifying at the wedding on Saturday. The bride didn't throw her bouquet, just passed it to Miranda, <laughs> while someone shouted, as if. <laughs> but I am determined to find you someone, and so, drum roll, please, I am hosting a Pride and Prejudice themed party. <laughs> Next Friday, the only day Edmund de Tory can do. <laughs> Wait, Mum, Mum, did you say Friday? Yeah. Oh, I, I, I definitely can't make Friday. Why not? Well, it's my daughter's first birthday. <laughs> you don't have a daughter? I don't have a daughter. Uh, I am voting in the House of Commons. You're not an MP? I'm not an MP. Uh, I'm washing my shoes. <laughs> i tell you what it is. I am baking a hedgehog for Tony Benn's anniversary. I just... I can't... I get in a panic. It's a condition. I'm sweating. Oh, hello. Mum, listen. I don't want... A Such fun! No, I don't think... Such fun! No, Mum, don't... Such fun! 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 So okay. that's ten years ago. This yeah. very month, actually, we made that. Um, and I know it probably feels really dated to you now. It felt quite dated at the time because no one was making studio sitcom and we, they all thought we were a bit mad. But Miranda's such a physical performer and I know everyone goes on about her falling over, but I always loved it, um, that we wanted something that, you know, lived up to her comedy kind of, you know, strengths. So we did this in front of a studio audience and I know a lot of people go on about canned laughter. We had to turn the laughter down right. because... What happens is when you get it right, people really resonate with characters and you find a tribe in comedy because we don't all like the same comedies. And I know that a lot of people here won't like that. 
And I'm proud of that, because if you make something that speaks to an audience, I think that's a massive achievement. It's when everyone goes, yeah, I don't really care. I think that's when you haven't made a good comedy. If people vehemently hate it, I think you're probably onto a good thing, because not everybody's the same. But we were very proud to make it. And also, it was a big, brave thing to do. We looked down the lens. I know Phoebe Waller-Bridge now takes all the credit, but we did things that we were inspired by uh, sitcoms that we watched growing up. So we were like the two Ronnies and French and Saunders and, um, and Victoria Wood. And we loved all of these kind of big physical performers. Um, and even at the end, we did this thing where we, at the end of the credits, we put, we ha you have been watching, which is a really old thing that used to put on Dad's Army and things like that when you'd see all of the, the cast. So we were sort of ha having fun with the form, but it actually felt quite modern and we were being quite realistic with the story of a woman out of place and trying to be herself. So um, it was a very exciting show to be a part of when it took off mm. um, because I don't think we expected it to be as loved as it was. It really was loved. It, and it starts on BBC Two. So again, studio sitcom, they normally go on BBC One because they're meant to be broad and they're meant to be uh, kind of mass uh, market yeah. um, kind of audiences. Um, but this was something we started on BBC Two and just was a little bit quieter, but it grew. Um, and I think that helped us, yeah. you know, kind of not, not feel too over um, scrutinised, I think, when I we first went I think that's the nice thing about BBC launching pilots. You do have spaces for them to grow and yeah. become and get a groundswell mm -hmm. before you put it front and centre on a channel like One where it has to just hit. Of course it you know, does. And grab as many people as possible. So... On the Miranda team, your role was? I was producer. And what does that mean? Day to day, what does it mean to be a producer on a show like Miranda? So you gather the team as producer. You, you know, you um, hire a, a director, um, a designer, the person that designs the sets. Um, you do all the casting. You look after the script. Um, so it was a really fun but hard process to kind of to cast something that's um, brand new. So... Um, you think these people are all like destined to play these parts. Now they, they look so brilliant when you see them. But it took a long time. In fact, Sarah Hadland walked into, into a casting with us. And we'd seen a few people that day. And she just got into a big rant about some builders had blocked in her car on the way and she was late. And we just went, well, that's Stevie. Yeah. She's arrived. <laughs> so a lot of people brought their own um, kind of interpretations to it and just made them uh, kind of these characters come to life. So it's a really exhilarating part of the process, casting and, and finding Tom Ellis to play Gary. Mm -hmm. We swooned when he came in and we thought, yeah, he'll be the man. Um, so the, the, the script is also very important and um, we had other script editors that helped Miranda and, and it got honed and honed and over a week of making a studio sitcom, you, um, you re rehearse it and hone it before the studio audience comes in on the, on the Friday. So you have five days in the studio to get it right and to camera rehearse. So it's a play. You're putting on a live play in front of a studio audience. Yeah. Um, and it's a very expensive uh, evening of cameras or, you know, looking at their watches. So it's um, an exciting way of making television. Yeah. Um, but it becomes perceived as old-fashioned, I suppose, because people aren't doing it so much. Well, sure. I mean, the times change. But from script to screen to the edit, one would say the producer is the first in, last out. Is that a true Yes, that, Yes. I think as a, a comedy producer, um, your DNA is through everything. So you can... Sometimes you may work with a writer and then you cast something with actors. Other times you work with someone like Miranda, who's a writer-performer, who has a very strong opinion and quite rightly, you know, is, is part of the creative process. So every show is different mm -hmm. and, and every relationship with a writer or, or a, a bit of talent, I think, kind of varies from show to show. You can be very light touch with some productions and much more involved in others. Mm -hmm. So after years of producing and doing various bits and bobs at the BBC, you were called to well. the commissioning table <laughs> at Channel 4. Yes, I mean, it's a dream job. So I loved being a producer and I kind of worked my way up through 10 years at the BBC in-house comedy department. Um, and I felt uh, the BBC is an amazing place. and I felt so privileged to work there. I'd watched their programmes all, all the way through my childhood and it felt like a dream to work for them. Um, but Channel 4 I went to next as a commissioning editor um, and it was kind of the call you can't say no to. So they were at the time riding high with the in-betweeners mm -hmm. and um, Friday Night Dinner had done Phone Shop and some brilliant shows. So I just thought, oh, I'd love to play with some new people. Um, so a commissioning job is you're part of the creative process, but you don't get your hands dirty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't go home and cry. Um, it's more... That's a good point, actually. Sorry to interrupt. Who out there knows what 
the word commissioning means in terms of TV? A few, quite a few of you. So, yeah, so it's one of those um, terms that we throw around a lot. You know, the commissioner said, and we're going to be commissioned, and we've just been commissioned, or we need to get that commission. It's one of those um, catch-all phrases that we use, and we're in a very jargon-heavy um, industry anyway. So just to break down commissioning, from your perspective, especially as we're talking about your move from producer to commissioner, what was that? move like and what was that how did that terminology become your day-to-day -day life well for every broadcaster they, they have a team of genre specific commissioners so comedy experts so when i went over to channel four there was a, a very small team of comedy commissioners that i joined and shane allen was the head um and they developed shows with the independent um kind of product producers and production companies. And then they sort of sell it up the line to the head of E4, the head of the channel, Channel 4. So you're presenting you know, all your favorite things that you want to get away. You don't necessarily have the power to put them on telly, but you develop them to a point where hopefully somebody then get, gives you the green light to put them and, and to give you the money to make them. So it's the same for every broadcaster, I imagine, that there's a chain of command that you go through. Yeah, definitely. The same at the BBC, the same Shane Allen who called you no, up. Yeah. <laughs> it's the same Shane Allen who um, told me to come in and cover a six month maternity, and which never left. turned into a four year journey. Um, <laughs> And it was it, it it was a very sort of ambiguous term when I first um, joined the TV world. Um, but what I understand the commissioning job to be is the nurturer and the cheerleader for an idea. Your enthusiasm, your ability to understand who your audience is, what they expect from you as a channel, what a BBC audience is looking to see versus what a Channel 4 audience is looking to see. And when the right idea comes in, giving it all the support it needs, giving it notes, giving it suggestions, casting suggestions, things like that. And absolutely, it is a chain of um, kicking it up. It's I call it the chain of pom-poms. I'm cheerleading it to Shane. <laughs> Shane cheerleads it to the channel and then the channel sort of decides to back us with the money and put it on screen. So that, in a nutshell, I think, is the role of the commissioner to be the supportive, creative lead of your idea, help you get money for your, for your idea, make sure they steer it so that it's suitable for the end user, i.e. the audience, and then see that all the way through. But I think the day-to-day -day job of the commissioner is quite varied. So obviously you do look after the shows that are in production and, and coming through, but also you're taking a lot of meeting with writers, mm -hmm. with agents, with production companies, with producers, with talent, with you know, who have vague ideas that they want to do. So um, lots of things come from lots of different places and at various stages of development. So you know, the most general way of getting something into a um, commissioner is through script in, in scripted comedy. So um, the odd treatment would come through, but more often than, than, than not, a full script and a well worked out script is the best way to kind of get someone's attention. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of um, broadcasters don't take scripts um, just ad hoc. It needs to come through either an agent or a producer. Um, and I think that's all it kind of to protect the writer, really, because at least if you're having somebody present it for you, you've had some notes from them, you've had some advice, you've whittled it down to the right amount of pages. Yeah. They'll advise you whether there's uh, it's a similar thing to something they've already got or, you know, it's, it's worth knowing that a, a good producer is on your side and to help you um, kind of get your work to be presented in the best possible way. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose uh, some things land that are brilliant and they're just not right. So every commissioner for every department, every broadcaster has a different remit. So Channel 4 was exciting because it was all about new talent, trying to get unseen worlds on television, trying to back the unheard voice, new um, writers, new performers, and also new produ production staff, so yeah. producers and directors often got their first break on Channel 4, not always on a half hour comedy, blaps the short form um, kind of, uh, comedy slices, not slices, but we yeah. We do slices, yeah. You do slices, <laughs> you do they did laps. Um, but they're the nursery slopes for scripted comedy to let people have that first taste of what it's like to kind of go through the system. And it's very invaluable and often led to a commission. Mm -hmm. And speaking of new talent, you came across a talented writer who wasn't new to the industry, but certainly new to Channel 4, yeah. when a little script landed on your desk called Catastrophe. Ah, yes. So tell us about how well, that journey started. 
talk about being a comedy fan. I've been a very big fan of um, Sharon Horgan since she made um, Pull-In, which is one of the most underrated comedies, I think, on TV. Love it. Um, so was aware of her and had done um, some developments with her at the BBC. So, you know, as ever, every day you have a, an inbox full of scripts as a commissioning editor. You either things are about to be filmed that you've got to give notes on or just um, kind of the the things that you need to go through and say yes or no to. Um, it just so happened that um, I think Sharon sent something through that morning and I'm a big fan of hers, so I opened up that email and just thought I'll read the first couple of pages and then read the whole script and thought, well, that's good. Gave it to our head of um, comedy, Phil Clark, at the time, and then he he also read it at lunch, which is unheard of in commissioning. Normally it's like six months to yeah. read something. <laughs> um, and so we both went, well, this is pretty special, emailed her, and she was in at four that afternoon. She was on her bike in town, so she came in. So some things just, kept, you know, the alchemy of the stars aligned and, and everyone likes it, and yeah. she's, a, you know, such a brilliant writer. So from, from that moment on, it was like, oh, well, let's get Rob on the line and kind of did a, a conference call with him in L.A., and then we piloted it really quickly. So they don't all work like that. And no. again, those good scripts, they just leap out. It's not nothing to do with me being a brilliant eye for talent. It's like they're very rare and quite brilliant when you yeah. do read them, so fully formed and, and clever. I think there were quite a few moments of magic in catastrophe for me it was Sharon as a writer but then Rob's input and their chemistry on screen mm -hmm. which I think is absolutely magical in fact we've got a clip of catastrophe um, next so if we could cue that then we can talk more about right, how yeah. that all went hey hey are you awake uh -uh. can I talk to you okay can you open your eyes Listen, I know it's hard when you can't sleep, but I was asleep. And don't you think it's good if one of us sleeps? No. I think it's good if you make me feel better and then both of us sleep. I don't agree, but okay. I keep getting very horny and very depressed at the exact same moment. It's awful. That sounds like hormones. What if something happens to the baby? Nothing's gonna happen to the baby. But what if he has a weird shaped head? Like, what if he needs to wear one of those special helmets? You should be thankful they even do helmets now. I mean, in the old days, if your baby had a weird-shaped head, he just grew into a man with a weird-shaped head. What if you die? I had a full checkup right before I came over here. Do you have life insurance? No, but I'll get some. We'll get you life insurance, too. Okay. Not too big a policy for me, though. I don't want you to murder me to get the money. I'm not going to murder you. I mean, when women get murdered, it's like 85% of the time their husband that did it. They totally know it was me. Even if I wanted to kill you, I wouldn't kill you. Or have you killed. I won't kill you either. Thanks, honey. I keep getting this recurring vision that I'm in a restaurant and I have to go to the loo, but I take the wrong turn and I walk into the kitchen where an Italian chef is talking and gesticulating and the knife he's holding stabs me in the baby. You know, because Italian people talk with their hands. Anything else? Yes. The world is a toilet. You know, we might not kill each other, but that doesn't mean terrorists won't. Or that your government won't start another war tomorrow, just fucking because. Well, you can't worry about everything. I mean, it's just too much. You know, there's Ebola and global warming. Well, I'm worrying about all that, too. Well, we'll be fine. But you know who global warming will kill in our lifetime? Bangladeshis. Just millions of Bangladeshis. And who gives a shit about them? I mean, why can't there be, like, an airborne gout that just kills rich people? I'd like to wake up to news that Monaco had been wiped out by an avalanche of poorly built palaces. I think we got a little bit off. And, and do you know what percentage of greenhouse gases Bangladesh produces? No. Roughly zero, okay? But Bangladesh is being eaten by the ocean while we drive Range Rovers to the mall to buy underpants that were stitched by a seven-year-old who literally, in 2015, is an indentured servant, and let's just say slave, okay? Because her life is shit in a ditch. It's not even shit in a toilet. Yeah, well, I won't get fixed by some whining idiot lying in bed lecturing a pregnant woman. Well, uh... Night, night. Yeah, sleep tight, asshole. <laughs> Love Nice, those two. jolly family sitcom. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so tell us, how did the production process of a script like that go from being this brilliant pilot that you love to this massive hit on Channel 4? Well, I'll be honest and say, no one ever predicts. Every script that you have that you love and you nurture doesn't always end up being the one that's going to be the kind of the huge critical success. 
we loved this and we thought it was such a brilliant project, but we were so proud when it, other people kind of joined in and also agreed that it was very good. Um, they grew as, as writers and they just kept getting better and better, I think, and so much more confident. And they were, you know, saying things that have never been said in family sitcoms and everything that you thought, like, should I be thinking this, they were saying. So I think it resonated with a lot of people. It was like the anti-family sitcom in a way, but um, it was one of those shows, I think, that um, we needed, you know, another taste and another viewpoint. So. Um, I'm so pleased it went on to, to be as loved as it was. Yeah. And, and they're both two absolutely brilliant pieces of talent. Absolutely. And after working at Channel 4, for how long were you there for? Seven years. Seven long years. <laughs> um, years. You took some time off and then came back and started working with a Northern Irish writer called Lisa McGee. Well, no, that, well, that was at Channel 4, actually. Oh, that so, was at... um, so during my time at Channel 4, you know, you, you do get behind bits of talent that you really appreciate and love and want to nurture. Some things land, some things don't. I've often said this, that... Um, as a genre, it's really difficult to make comedy because, as I said before, people often hate something that somebody else loves. Um, the, these days of Twitter, as soon as the, 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 the credits start going up, somebody's gone, I, I hate this, I hope whoever commissioned it dies. You literally get that Absolutely. sort of response. So um, it, it, it can kind of create quite strong feelings. So um, not all comedy lands the way you want it to. Um, we worked on a series with Lisa McGee, who wrote Derry Girls, called London Irish, and she's a fantastic writer from Derry, from Northern Ireland. Um, and she wrote this um, fantastic uh, portrayal of her and her friends coming to London and going a little bit wild and being kind of outsiders in, in London and, um, uh, you know, all the japes they get up to. Um, and it was brilliant, and I was so excited to work on it. I didn't commission it, but I looked after the series. And then it went out and some people liked it, some people didn't quite warm to it, but it wasn't one of those, you know, like the touch paper, this is a huge success. So we were, you know, a little bit thrown by that because sometimes you're so close to it, you think, well, this is, people are going to love this as much as I do. And for whatever reason, it doesn't always happen. But with her, she's an extraordinary, robust writer with lots of ideas. And a little while later, she came back and she said, I've had another idea and it's a thing called Dairy Girls. Um, so she, we commissioned a script and it was off the strength of the script because we knew that she could do it because she had just written the six-part series. Um, Jay Hunt, who was head of Channel 4 at the time, was um, very much behind her and said, I think we should, we should give it a go. So then Derry Girls happened. So without her going through that process, she probably learned a lot from that and then Derry Girls came out. And again, I didn't think that would be as loved as it was, but... It feels like a small show. It feels, when it's set in the 1990s, it's a really um, kind of regional accent-filled sitcom. It's um, looking at the Troubles, which is you know, a very unique piece of time. So all the cultural references could land flat if you don't know all about it. But it got 3.2 million on the kind of the second series, first episode TX, which is an extraordinary hit. Huge, so yeah. Should we see a clip of it? So just before the <laughs> clip, you said something interesting in there, another bit of jargon, which is we did a script commission. Yes. So just to break it down for the audience, sometimes in commissioning, it's not just a matter of we want the whole thing, we want a series, we're commissioning a series. Sometimes we take smaller steps, so we commission a script or we commission a table read. Um, the script, that is literally just delivering the paper. Um, the table read, that's where we um, cast real actors, get a director in, stage it. We can stage it in an office room and literally do it around a table or you can stage it in a, um, like an open hall and have people sort of be more physical and kind of embody those roles and things like that. So just to give you a little bit of insight, there are various stages of development that you can go through before the big almighty series commission, which is things like a script commission or a table read and little steps that let you know the, to prove the concept. Of course. I mean, pilots have been... Um, I think with drama, very often they get commissioned straight to series because the strength of the writing or here's a, a series Bible and you can tell the story and you don't have to prove so much. I think with, it's, it's generally storytelling and, and nothing else. With comedy, there's so much that can go wrong if you don't quite cast it right or if the... The, pay, the, the jokes on the page don't quite land in the performance. So pilots are really, really important in comedy. So most things have had a pilot before you commit to a series. And very often that becomes, I think, catastrophe. It becomes episode one. If it's very fully formed, you just kind of, you go, you're off and running, or you might do some tweaks and some retakes, film the odd scene that you want to do differently. And then it becomes the first episode. 
um, or you go, that didn't work and we want to do it slightly. We know what we need to do now. Yeah, and there's something about having that first thing, having a pilot or a show zero, um, if it's excellent, then it does become episode one. If it's not so excellent, at least you've got something to dissect. Totally. And tear apart and change that cast or change those lines or maybe even the setting. Yeah. And make it better so that when it does come out, it's fully formed. Yeah. Um, so to go back to the brilliant Derry Girls and that whole um, development, let's have a quick look at a clip and then we'll talk more about the production. Great stuff, okay. You're not seriously going to this concert, are you? Gig, Claire, it's called a gig. And I have to go invite me specifically. Motherfuckers! Motherfucker, it's my new thing. Watched this film last night. My dad got it off Pyro Pauline. And it's about these two lads and they wear these crackers just and they rock about just shooting people and eating cheeseburgers and they're all motherfucker this, motherfucker that. It's got your man in it. What do you call him? The disco dancer from the Who's Talking. Who owns the fella? Me. Well, come on then, Bollock. Are you introducing yourself or what? Hi, I'm Michelle's cousin, James. Why is he making that funny noise? He's English, Ola. That's the way they talk. He's me to Kathy's way. I told you about me to Kathy. She went to England years ago to have an abortion, never came back. Never got the abortion either. Look at you, James, eh? Huh? I didn't actually know that. <laughs> <laughs> Just brilliant, brilliant writing. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, so what are the elements that make a show like Deli Dairy Girls work? Well, it's interesting because if you go through kind of the last 10 years of, well, probably longer of comedy, there are so many school sitcoms, you know, from the in between us, you just think no one's ever going to top this group. You know, that you, I think every generation probably claims it as their own, and, and there's some girls on BBC Three, and it's some wonderful kind of. Um, uh, gang show looking at kids kind of coming of age. So I think this just has so many elements of recognisable life. You know, we've all, lots of people, well, we've all been to school um, and we've all been probably the, the uncool kids. I'm looking around the room, I'm sure there's lots of cool people here. But um, so I think they, those stories of the underdogs always resonate more than kind of the cool kids. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think her writing is so warm and witty and those characters are so well drawn, you know, it, it springs off the page and those and again the casting is second to none it's sort of to find those girls and and that one wee fella we were very very lucky the wee english fella yeah and in terms of the casting what was the process for that did you um start where the production was was that lisa's kind well, of wish they um i think so um i commissioned it and then left so um the head of comedy at channel 4 fiona mcdermott then delivered the series and that's done obviously such an extraordinary job but what's key i think in this is that they had two extraordinary um executive producers looking after the show um liz lewin and caroline leddy two legends of comedy so they had a very experienced team of uh, kind of producers that knew exactly what they couldn't not do and not land that that amazing kind of casting. So they um, did a really big um, trawl. They had, um, I think, a Northern Irish director, so totally in tune with what they were trying to do and the tone of the piece. So um, it's just, yeah, a lot of brilliant people in one, in one place delivered something like that. Definitely, and I think that show landing about, about a decade after In Between Us, yes, thereabouts, yeah. it started this whole kind of role or what people tend to call as the, you know, the comedy trends, sex education, Ackley Bridge, um, mm -hmm. and things like that. Do you, did you have um, a consciousness when you were looking at Derry Girls or commissioning Derry Girls no. that there was, you know, it was time for another round of school-based comedy? No, it's funny, I think, Trends in television, if only we knew what they actually were going to be, we'd all be rich. Yeah. I think um, comedy is a very odd one because, again, looking at 10 years ago, Miranda was a slapstick, um, kind of an old-fashioned show. These days you've got Phoebe Waller-Bridge doing and not a dissimilar thing in a way, kind of a, a, a dysfunctional woman at the heart of it, looking down the lens, but it's much more comedy drama. So the authorial uh, kind of writer, performer, writing about real life and um, much more dramatic beats, that's where we've gone. So um, Catastrophe started it, then you had Flowers, which is, again was very dramatic and magical and a bit weird. Um, it, it's it's playing with form sometimes. You kind of, you evolve and you move through, but it doesn't mean that there isn't a place for the silly. Yeah. There's kind of a sliding scale of comedy sometimes. And, you know, there's other shows that do so fantastically well, like Ghosts on BBC One at the moment, such brilliant, silly, clever things. And yet then you've got something as extraordinary as, um, as Fleabag, where 
you know, it is, it can make you laugh and make you cry in the, in the same half hour. So I think it's, it's an exciting time for narrative comedy, but it's very hard to predict where it goes. It is tough. I think when you work with someone as brilliant as Phoebe, she gets seen as the um, rule, but she is the exception. It's yeah. rare that somebody can straddle the two worlds, to straddle comedy and um, drama as well with Killing Eve, which she wrote and created. And you can tell that the stamp of levity and dark, is really, you know, her calling card. And mm -hmm. there's so many funny moments in Killing Eve and so many sort of edge-of-your-seat moments in um, Fleabag. And I think it's making a lot of the kinds of content that's coming our way mm -hmm. look like that. People are starting to think, ah, oh, comedy drama, being a bit this and a bit that mm -hmm. is the way forward. Have you noticed that that's coming your way? Well, from, I've only been back into the um, kind of production land for a couple of years, but at the end of my um, time at Channel 4, you definitely noticed <laughs> as things were getting traction um, in the, that dramatic world, you were getting pitched more and more things, but they felt quite derivative. So if something like Fleabag was um, riding high, you'd have all of these pictures or thing going to Fleabag light. Yeah. And you go, you go, well, I don't want it to be, well, we've got Fleabag, so yeah. what do you want to do? Don't feel you've got to make something in, in the kind of the shadow of that, that just feels genre um, close to that in its kind of genre style. Um, I don't think anyone ever knows what's going to come along. So it's always exciting when something catches fire, like as, as broad and as, as kind of warm as Dairy Girls can sit alongside that and both earn their space. Mm -hmm. um, I've kind of developed um, similar things that feel more drama than comedy. Um, because you know, every show is different and every writer has a different story to tell and, and, and different subject matter. Um, I think broadcasters are being quite brave these days by looking at subject matter that actually challenges people or say, says something. We did a pilot um, last year, which is now a series um, called In My Skin, mm -hmm. and that's looking at um, a coming-of-age story of a 16-year-old girl whose mum has bipolar, so has um, kind of um, episodes and has to go into hospital, but she hides all of that from her school friends, and it's lots of banter and fun. Mm -hmm. So it's the, the sort of the two worlds um, kind of fighting each other. But that I wouldn't call a comedy, even though it's, it's commissioned by comedy and yeah. it's a half hour. There are comedic moments in it, but it's definitely got a dramatic heart definitely and an authenticity to it. Because, again, it's based on real life and it's based on a, on, on a real story. So it's every show is different, mm -hmm. I suppose. So just tracking back a little bit. So the Dairy Girl story um, ushered in the end of your tenure as mm -hmm. a commissioner. Um, at Channel 4, and then you've entered into a new um, role as creative yes. director of a production company. So that transition, easy, smooth, bumpy? So, what I will say is <laughs> the best job in the world is working in commissions, so well done you. Thank you. It's, it's such a privilege. It's such a kind of creative roller coaster because there are so many things that come your way. You get stimulated daily by kind of brilliant people bringing lovely ideas to you. You see the cream of the crop. Everyone brings you their best ideas. So it was only when I went back to being a producer that I realised how lucky I'd been <laughs> because you go, where are all the good ideas? Surely they're everywhere. And then you realise you've really got to work to get something to a standard that you can share with a, um, a commissioner. So that was what I learned the hard way in going back to the floor. Um, but as a programme maker, you know, you, you've always got that itch, you want to make something. So whenever I was in the edit on Catastrophe or Flowers or Friday Night Dinner or anything that you just go, these are such joyful, brilliant programmes, I'm so proud to be a tiny bit associated. You're just a midwife, basically. You're helping them deliver something, but you're not integral to the creative process. Um, I always felt like, oh, I'd like to own something again and to be part of that process. So. That's why I went back to, to join this new indie, which is um, kind of such a brilliant opportunity to start from the beginning, to not inherit a, a slate of other people's ideas. Yeah, so to... it's a small indie, not a large one. So you went in with a bit of a startup hat well, on. Well, it's a weird one. It, uh, it's not weird. It's a multi-genre. So we make the big nasty show in the entertainment department, Mo Gilligan's show, and we'd also make um, kind of documentary series and um, and cooking show called The Brigade. And so it, there's lots of brilliant people there all doing different genres. So I'm the person doing comedy. Um, and we also have a drama department. They're making guilt that's on BBC and BBC Scotland at the moment, fantastic drama. So we all came there to go, what could we do together, you know, under this fantastic new company. So we've got two very clever kind of um, CEOs that have come from other indies and uh, have been commissioners in the past. So 
um, it was a no-brainer to join them. Peter Fincham that ran Talkback that made like Alan Partridge and things. So I watched like every comedy show, Brass Eye, everything they'd ever made growing up. So I thought to work with him would be a, a huge privilege. So, and um, Tim Hinks worked for companies that have made Black Mirror. So there's, um, they've got a, an amazing track record between them. So um, it's been an exciting two years, but hard work yes. to come back in and try and create stuff. So we're doing okay. We've got... Um, quite a silly sitcom that's been made for Sky at the moment. Nick Mohammed's a writer and performer who's written that. Um, and he's got David Schwimmer to somehow to, to be in it. So that's kind of quite an exciting one that'll land next year, which is much more silly and much more sitcom-like. So it's great because it's sort of cut you loose a little bit um, where all the comedies that were coming your way, as you said, you were just a small part of it. Now you're very much the kind of, yeah. you know, the nurturer, the maker of the dough. You get to see it all. Yes, and, you, and you, you're kind of the... Um, you're in charge of your own destiny as well. If you're running your own company, you can pick up the phone and go, I'd love, love to meet so-and-so writer. Can we have a cup of tea? And, you know, lots of conversations. They don't all come to fruition. and They don't all come with really brilliant ideas. But that's where you can be very um, kind of focused on who you want to work with and the sort of shows that you want to make. So I've been very, very lucky. There's been some brilliant people that have come through the door in the first couple of years. And we've been very lucky to get um, a pilot in a series and, and now this series for Sky as well. So... Um, it's nice to be, yeah, working yeah. hard again. <laughs> and one of the big things that we're always talking about in um, TV and comedy in particular is having less programmes that are set within London and within the mm -hmm. South. So I just want to talk a little bit more about In My Skin because that was set in Cardiff, which yes. is amazing. But first, let's have a quick look at a clip and then we'll talk about it. Brilliant. <laughs> so how so, did so, yeah, so, that come about? It was filmed in Cardiff. Um, we did that pilot last um, September, and two weeks ago we won two Welsh BAFTAs for it. So I'm extra yeah. extraordinarily proud of this show. Um, it's written by a young Welsh writer called Kayleigh Llewellyn, who's recently become a BAFTA um, breakthrough Brit. Um, for yeah, so for her writing, she's extraordinary, and she came to see me when I was a commissioner with another idea. And I, no one ever brings in Welsh writers, and I, so she made an impression on me. And I just thought, yes, yeah, she's a really bright spark. And again, all I ever wanted as a commissioner were things like Derry Girls set not in London. Why is everything got to be set in London? Um, to have a sense of place or a sen sense of sort of a community that you don't see on telly. So um, that's why I warmed so much to Derry Girls. And that's why I was so excited to kind of see if we could cook something up together. Kaylee's story is extraordinary. This is based on her own um, kind of upbringing. Um, so she wanted to so I commissioned her to write a script or we... Um, put it into the BBC and we um, very, very lucky to get a pilot for BBC Three and BBC Wales. But it meant going back to Cardiff to film it. Um, and I'm, you know, worked in telly for 20 years now and not one of those uh, years has been in Wales. I had to come to London to, you know, to where the work was and where telly was being made. So um, it was so exciting to go back. But Cardiff is like an extraordinary creative hub these days. And they've got um, so many film studios there and they're making Doctor Who and... Um, lot his dark materials was just filmed there, so it felt like a very exciting place to be. Um, and we filmed, we've just finished doing the the series now. So again, it feels fantastic to be making some stuff that represents people that aren't on telly, kind of stories that you wouldn't normally get heard, mm -hmm. and also an authentic, authentic Welsh writer, um, kind of, and it being filmed in Wales as well. So. Finally, I get to make something Welsh. Yeah, it's brilliant, and I think also the, um, the the lightness of touch in her writing, where she kind of goes from the struggle with the mum mm -hmm. to the lighter moments with the friend. As a producer, as somebody nurturing that project through, what were the kind of conversations that were had, and what were the kind of decisions that were had? How? much did you um, showcase the mum's disability um, and difficult moments in through the eyes of this teenage girl? Mm -hmm. Well, not all comedies are as complex as, as this. You know, the subject matter has to be um, done properly. And we had um, kind of mental health advisors that looked at the script and looked at how we were depicting kind of um, things like the hospital scenes. So we wanted it to be as accurate as possible. And we did, certainly didn't want to dramatise anything that wouldn't have happened or wouldn't have been real. So um, we took a huge amount of care and you've got a duty of care to a writer as well to make sure that they're protected um, and you know their work is, is going to be sensitively portrayed. So we found a fantastic director called Lucy Forbes who did the pilot and has just done the series and 
she's just produced um, the second series of End of the Fucking World for Netflix and for Channel 4. Um, so she's an extraordinary talent and she's done something quite magical with this, is that um, there's hope all the way through it. There's some quite dark subject matter in there, but there's a lot of joy and there's a lot of kind of normal everyday kind of banter between the, the gang of friends. So I, I know there's a lot of heart to it, even though it's not laugh out loud all the way through. I think you really root for her and um, the central performance, Gabrielle Creevy, who plays Beth, and that she won the BAFTA for best performance because, you know, it is an, an extraordinary performance. So, again, very lucky to have all of those very clever women making a, a programme with me. So this is great. We've kind of had a bit of a journey from slapstick, silliness, breaking the fourth wall to... Um, uh, Dairy Girls, which is a very sort of specific time and place-based um, storytelling, mm -hmm. but, you know, anyone can come to it. It's very accessible. Everyone's had that teenage life, you know, what it is to not be so cool but trying to make out you are cool to something like In My Skin, which is tackling, you know, mental health and, you know, young carers and, you know, the types of struggles that regular people have in TV. So my last question to you is... British comedy, Neris. <laughs> Where's it going? Where next? We've had slapstick, we've had comedy drama, we've had, you know, laugh out loud sitcom. Where next? Wherever it goes, I think it's going to do OK. With all of the streamers, all the Netflix, everyone's, you know, suddenly Apple creating things. Um, I just think that the, the money that... The, the type of shows that we make in Britain and the quality of shows it is sort of like n nowhere else on earth. Mm. So I think, you know, when Americans sort of look look to us now, before they used to be, you know, they'd have a team writer writing sitcom where they can keep it going, Modern Family, the standard's amazing, they can do, like, 90 episodes. Um, and we are there going, we've got six. Yeah. We can't quite compete <laughs> because everything's authored and, and takes a long time for some one person to write it. So um, I think we were always the poor relation. But now I think, especially people like Phoebe, they're international stars now. With Netflix, Derry Girls has gone mad on Netflix. Suddenly American audiences are finding these little shows that have been crafted and loved and, you know, um, have a, a lot of uh, for, you know, fans in the UK. But I think the quality of our writing and, and the sense of comedy, I think it, it, you know, it, it does bode well. People yeah. want narrative comedy and, um, and we've got some really talented writers yeah. and performers. Definitely. And I think, you know, working for um, a company like the BBC, which is a public service broadcaster, I think on one hand, you do want to serve the industry. You do want to know that people that have come through your door, who've been nurtured by you, who've been talent scouted by you and supported, end up on your screens. Mm -hmm. And that becomes their calling card for America to come poaching. Yeah. You know, so it's sort of every time we find someone that we love and have had a really good journey with, off they go and we don't see them for a few years. I mean, we waited for... We were meant to wait for a year for Phoebe to come back between episode, um, series one and two. We ended up waiting two years, and the minute the second one landed, off she went again. Um, and ditto, you know, shows um, that we're nurturing now, like Young Offenders, um, Famalam, we're seeing cast members being poached and taken off to Hollywood and things mm -hmm. like that. So it's a great talent story, and it's a great... Um, story of talent journeys um, and I think um, in terms of looking for new writers looking for authentic voices that's something that we do so well mm -hmm. in the UK and I think that's something that will always ha be our key strength you know nurturing um, new writers are given in that first go at creating a thing. I did think when I saw Phoebe Wallabridge get her um, Emmy the other yeah. day and she stood on that stage and she or you know quite rightly get all that accolade a public service broadcaster made that show. Absolutely. And they got behind her and they gave her the opportunity yep. to make it. And I think, you know, thank God for the BBC, thank God for Channel 4, because that's their remit. They they are there to support new talent. They are there to kind of create the stars of yeah. tomorrow and to kind of give them their first break. So as long, long may they do keep doing that. <laughs> Absolutely. OK, so I think we've had um, more than enough time Sorry, to give we've you talked a too much. Sorry. trot through uh, Neris's incredible CV. Have you got any questions for either Neris or myself about comedy? I've got one here. Hi. Hi there. Um, would you say that during your, your time in the industry, are there things that perhaps you would have commissioned 10 years ago that in, in the current uh, climate you wouldn't commission now? I'm sure. I mean, as far as kind of taste change, so do, do society and things you might have laughed at kind of in the 70s or the 80s. Mm -hmm. It's like we're, it won't even repeat them now, and quite rightly too. 
I think it's true that things move on. And um, I mean, even Little Britain I, I mentioned earlier, I think it is interesting that would you have written that now? Probably not. And I think they've admitted as much themselves as writers. You know, you write, I think comedies are, some things stand the test of time and the writing's beautiful and, and it's, it's got a very long legacy comedy. Um, and you can still watch Dad's Army now and appreciate it and yeah. love it. Um, and I'm sure there's lots of shows that you'll keep watching, but some, I think they do burn quite brightly and go. Um, I've not regretted commissioning anything. I, I mean, I've not, not made any terrible <laughs> kind of faux pas, yeah. but there's some things I'm more proud of than others, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in terms of um, the volume that we produce as well, you know, in the UK, because yeah. it's all authored, they do six at a time, it's six per series. So you get things like The Office, which was two times six, mm -hmm. and then when it went over to the US, it was 10 times 24. You know, they have bigger writing teams, they have more to bring to projects, they can pull in more star power. You know, yeah. we launched all of those faces. No one really knew a Gervais or a um, Martin Freeman um, and people like that when The Office first landed, but now they're sort of bigger stars. They've gone on to bigger, longer journeys, whereas with the US, they have the ability to have a bit more of a head start by bringing big names early doors and then growing from there. So I think, as Neris was saying, tastes change, what's appropriate changes in this kind of um, era of accountability slash cult cancel culture slash keeping an eye on who's sort of behaving well. There are some things that absolutely would not stand the test of time. Um, but then, as I say, as you said, comedy is so joyous when it's evergreen, you can have shows like an Ab Fab or a Only Fools where, mm -hmm. look at Friends, the resurgence of Friends on Netflix and how, you know, this world of um, young adults are discovering Friends for the first time and enjoying it, mm -hmm. you know, and when you go back to uh, watch it, you laugh in the same places. Definitely. Some things can be evergreen. Any other questions? Hi, um, so my question is, obviously you touched on The Office um, and obviously you were saying about Netflix and Derry Girls people discovering it. Do you think there's a, a key to making a comedy an international success or do you even know or not know when you're making it? Oh, do you know what? I, I think you can be cynical and you can do some things that you think might safeguard uh, you know, an, um, an international audience but by maybe having people from both sides of the Atlantic in it. Um, I think things like The Office... If it's good, I think it will travel. You know, these days there are a lot of um, shows that are subtitled as well. You know, the um, Call My Agent, that amazing French uh, kind of comedy drama, has really resonated as well. And you go, well, when was the last time you watched a French comedy? <laughs> I suppose yeah. these things do, if they're good, they will travel. Um, I think people sometimes do it more cynically, but there have been successes. Um, you mentioned it earlier, sex education. You know, such an extraordinary... Um, uh, look to that show it's like where is it set it could be anywhere it could be at any time it was literally filmed in Newport where I'm from so it, it doesn't look like that I promise you um people in kind of American jackets um look American High school lockers, yeah yeah very strange but beautiful but because also it's really it feels massively nostalgic because we all grew up watching American teen shows so um there's some very clever choices I think sometimes that have worked and I'm sure um, there are others that probably might have been done more cynically and, and might not have. It still has to be good, I think. Yeah, I think things like um, End of the Fucking World and Sex Education have that Netflix remit. They were in conversation with streamers and international broadcasters in the making. So that's where you can kind of add a few extra ingredients to the dough. But for the most part, I think the more specific and true your story is, the more it'll travel. Um, you know, you take um, famous sketches, uh, they could be British based but other countries, other cultures can understand them. We had um, a conversation earlier about how we released individual clips from a sketch series that I look after called Famalam. And we had this moment where we had these um, older aunties who rock up to a party laden with empty Tupperware looking to take home the leftovers. And we had that go out on Facebook and throughout the comments, it was like, oh my God, this is so my Jewish aunties. That is so my Italian aunties, my Indian aunties all day. <laughs> and that, you know, is a testament to how a very specific idea can have legs and can travel and can find resonance if you execute it right. And if you don't execute it thinking, oh, I hope the world understands. Execute it in a way that you understand, 
in a truth that you know to be true and a few people around you in a smaller orbit know to be true and then it will just somehow it will grow from there yeah. any last questions before we wrap up one more hi so Miranda's being recorded the 10th year anniversary. Are you part of the production for that? And no, but that was in-house BBC made that. So kind of the production company was the BBC. So yeah, I've been invited to sit in the audience, but I'm not sure <laughs> if I can make it now, but yeah. Would it be true to its story or is it going with the, oh, so much fun? I think it's more of a celebration. So they're doing, I think, a, a live show at the Palladium. Do you know about uh, it? No, I've um, read I've that read it's going it, I've read on, it the other day. Um, but yeah. Get a ticket. <laughs> right, that was it. I just <laughs> part of that. Yes, no yes. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. I hope that our conversation was somewhat insightful, somewhat enlightening, gave you a few um, ideas about how to go about um, producing comedy, if that's something of interest to you, um, engaging with writers, maybe being a director in the comedy genre. Um, we certainly are always on the lookout for more people to work with, talk to, nurture and see go on a long journey. Um, only if you promise not to leave us for Amazon and big fat <laughs> checks. Thank you so much. <laughs>